welcome to one of the last sessions of uh, the 8th uh, Delphi Forum. We are going to discuss uh, about how Ukraine shaped uh, global dynamics. Ukraine is a theme that is coming all over uh, the forum. I will, we have some distinguished uh, speakers to discuss the matter. I will present. I start with uh, William Drozdiak. He's a Global Europe Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in the United States. Uh, he's an expert on European affairs. Uh, Mrs. Svetlana Kovalchuk, Executive Director, Director Yalta European Strategy Institute in uh, Ukraine. And uh, Mrs. Tatiana Prokopchuk, Vice President of the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine. We have Mr. Greg Mills from South Africa. He's director and uh, member of the advisory board of the Brent Hurst Foundation at the Royal United Service Institute, also an expert on international affairs. And Mr. Tommy Utanen, executive direct, director at the Wilfrid Mart Martin Center for European Studies. It's a think tank of the European People's Party. So I, will, I would like to start from our uh, guest from the United States in order to discuss how does the Ukrainian uh, question affect the big poles, United States, Europe, and China? We will we'll discuss about China. But to see, in the beginning, we saw, Mr. Drozdiak, we saw united front of United States and Europe. I would like you to comment on how does this front evolve, do, because we have different approaches, and we start to see that these approaches differ more and more, and we have difference in, within the European front. And how does this evolve, and how do you think it's going to affect the possible uh, uh, finding of a solution in the conflict? Uh, well, I think it's, it's obvious, as has been stated on many panels, that uh, this war has produced a surprising and uh, a surprisingly uh, strong uh, uh, show of unity between Europe and the United States. And people are worried about whether it continues. I think it will, because I think people are so horrified by the atrocities that have been committed by Russian soldiers in Ukraine that, uh, that they will be continue, continue to be motivated to, to support it. There's talk about whether the, some Republicans in Congress will pull back, so there'll be uh, uh, disputes about the nature of it. But I think the, the gravity of, uh, of these atrocities has really struck people deep in the soul. And I, and I think this will be important to, to uh, see how the Ukrainian people respond in the longer run, because as we, was discussed in the previous panel, we need to think beyond the, the, this conflict. At some point it will end, uh, we don't know when, but uh, we need to be prepared for the new geopolitical contours of our world um, after this conflict. And much of that will be set by the moral tone of Ukraine. I mean, the title of this panel is The Spirit of Ukraine. And I remember as a journalist covering the Balkan Wars uh, um, and in uh, uh, talking with Richard Goldstone, the UN prosecutor of war crimes in the Balkans, but also in Rwanda and Burundi. And he said the thing that shocked him the most was how the worst crimes against humanity were committed neighbor against neighbor, people who knew each other for 30, 40 years in both regions, radically different cultures. And I think this is the shocking thing about what's happened in Ukraine, that, uh, that uh, there's so much uh, integration of the cultures and the history of uh, Russia and Ukraine, and to see these atrocities committed, and whether Ukraine will show us the way out of this in the post-conflict stage, whether there can ever be some kind of a reconciliation. I doubt it will be early, maybe a generation. But um, I think it's a credit to the Biden administration that they've allowed the, uh, uh, Zelensky and his uh, government to take the lead, and we have not pressured them into an early armistice. Uh, we, 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 will follow, we have followed, in a way, uh, the moral lead of, of the Ukrainian government. So, uh, we'll come to that. I would like now to come to our Ukrainian uh, uh, speakers in order to have the context of the country. Mrs. Kovalchuk, uh, what is the political situation in Ukraine now? 
vis-à-vis uh, -vis the how is the the stance of United States and Europe perceived in uh, in Ukraine, and what uh, is the political context that this creates? Dear George, fellow panelists, dear friends of Ukraine, first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak, to be in here, and I think it's uh, really something special because it seems to me the four days where just everyone is discussing Ukraine about its first panels where Ukrainians as person are present, and I'm thank you for this opportunity. Actually, yesterday it was again very bad day for Ukraine because Russia again attacked absolutely peaceful Ukraine. Ukrainian city in central Ukraine early in the morning when people were sleeping. And yesterday, uh, Russian missile hit absolutely peaceful uh, nine-story building in Ukraine and killed 23 people, among them five children. I will say here, and my government, my president repeat it all the time, we will never forgive what Russia brings to Ukraine. We will fight for each dead people, for each destroyed building, for everything was destroyed, and we will fight till the end. Speaking about political situation, I, will, I want to say that we are united. We are all together. And our colleagues just mentioned about close connection between the Russian and Ukrainian culture. I would love to say there is no such connection now. There is Ukraine, Ukrainian civilization, there is Ukrainian culture. We are absolutely independent nation. Of course, before the war, for a lot of people it was unclear. What is, what is Ukraine? Is it country or it's a part of Soviet Union? Or maybe it's a part of Russia? But now I'm sure everyone now what is Ukraine? That Ukraine is independent, democracy country, that we as Ukrainians are really bravery people and we fight for each part of our land and we will continue to do it real till the, till the final end. And for... And now I think for nobody is in the question for which country, which civilization belongs to Ukraine, because Ukraine is a part of civilized democratic world. Before the war, of course, it was in the question, it, as we all know, because we have some historical reason to think about it, because part of Ukraine was under very strong Russian influence, and part of Ukraine was under strong European influence, and now we united. It was really big uh, effort for Ukraine, a big sign of understanding uh, that we have all European support, that acceptance uh, given for Ukraine's status of EU membership. And I again want to say you that we will, it's a lot of discussion when we, if we will get granted it, when we will get, uh, have it, but I want to say that we will fight for it as strong as we are fighting now at the front. Because for us, it's about future. It's about our uh, good future within Europe. And we understand it will be not so easy. But it's also a clear path which we will follow, which reforms we need to do. And we are doing these reforms even now. From the first day of the war, all the Ukrainian government was in Ukraine, and we are continuing doing reform. It's hard now because we need to fight. We need to fight for our lives. We need to fight for our money because we have a lot of financial problems, of course. And we are all saying that we have several fronts, military fronts, financial fronts. And of course, we are fighting now for culture because we have also culture fronts. And as colleagues mentioned, it uh, matters uh, culture because it's part of our nation, but we will do it, and I'm sure. And speaking about the future, we are sure that this brutal war created also opportunity because it's shown for everyone in this world that we need a new architecture of global security. And maybe, as you know, several months ago, our president suggested new peace formula of global security. And this new security order should base absolutely on victory of Ukraine. 
we see no other possibility as in part of this world order should be of course safety of all states within the world, energy security. We will make sure also that Fatain uh, will never use its weapons against uh, any nation in the world. And we make sure that food security will work on the proper way. Again, as there are so many Russian war crimes in Ukraine captured each single day, we or everyone make sure that that never will happen again. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Pro Pro Kopchuk, um, you are more focused on uh, the business and the economy side. So, I don't know if it's too early to discuss, but we would like you to give us uh, the picture of the economic and financial situation in Ukraine, and if you have some thoughts on the, the day after, because. We have the conflict, but uh, in the future we'll have uh, many, many things that uh, have to be done in Ukraine. Thank you, George. It's absolutely perfect moment. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here and to share the view of the business community operating in Ukraine. The American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine is the international business association that has been delivering the shared voice of the best-in-class U.S., Ukrainian, international companies since 1992. We represent the business community, communities that invested more than $50 billion into the economy and stay committed to Ukraine. Business in Ukraine is absolutely inspired by the bravery of lion-hearted defenders in the front line, and the business community continue to show robust resilience. They believe in Ukraine, and they keep the economy running. The banking system remains operational and liquid. Mobile communication and network are up and running, and it is remarkable how energy heroes recovered infrastructure after every single Russian attack and helped us to get through the winter. Despite this brutal war, the tech industry demonstrated tremendous results. It is $7.3 billion industry, and over the last year, what we see, the tech sector has grown over 6%. Kyiv stands, Ukraine stands, and the business community stands united with Ukraine. The largest Coca-Cola plant, bottling plant in Europe in terms of production volume is in Kyiv region, near Brovary. In February last year, it was occupied, then it was liberated, then Coke restored, and now it is full operation. Moreover, the Coke developed a built kindergarten really supporting the community. Another example is McDonald's. Since, intro, since its reopening in September, they opened 84 restaurants, including in Bucha, Odessa, and Dnipro. We have ABCDs, ADM, Bunger, Cargill, Dreyfus, and key domestic players. They are large agriculture exporters, and they are continue working. And speaking about Ukrainian agriculture industry, a lot of efforts have been made by the Ukrainian companies making sure of the operation of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. And it is continuation is crucial for the global food supply chains and the security. And it is vitally important to make sure it is prolonged and to include Mykolaiv's support into the uh, seaport into the grain corridor. Companies believe in Ukraine and investments are coming even during the war. As we speak, just yesterday, Horizon Capital, this is a US private equity firm, announced its latest fund reached $254 million. And this is the largest fund that was raised since February 24. Irish company Kinspam is to invest 200 million euro to build new technology campus. Unilever announced 20 million euro to build the brand new facility in Kyiv region. Bayer is to invest more than 60 million euro to expand its current production facility, including the state-of-art equipment, uh, storages, and bomb shelters. And business is getting ready to the recovery. And we do understand that it will be the greatest recovery and reconstruction in Europe since World War II. And the, the volume and the scale is massive. According to, to the latest World Bank report, the cost of reconstruction has grown to $411 billion, so you can imagine. And it will require joint effort of the government, international partners, the business community, and the role of the business community, the private sector, will be massive. 
Our companies are getting ready to the recovery and they are ready to take part actively in their building, recovery, reconstruction. And we call on global companies to join this effort and to prioritize Ukraine in their business plans and to be a part of the recovery effort. There are discussions on risk, but it's fair to talk about opportunity. This is the real case during historical times of the EU candidacy granting. And our message is clear. Ukraine is open for business. We invite global companies to, to, that are not in Ukraine to come to Ukraine to do it now. It's risky to invest in Ukraine right now, but it's risky not to invest. Come to Ukraine and do it now. Thank you. So that's a, a very positive message for the future. And uh, we'll discuss later, you, must, you will describe the opportunities and what do must Westerners must do in order to be prepared. So, uh, Greg, I would like your thoughts on how does this uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, conflict uh, shaped, uh, affected the relations and the balance of power between the United States and Europe, and how does this, uh, how could this uh, uh, influence the, the day after? Well, thank you very much. Um, obviously, I'm going to talk to, about things from an African perspective, which is a slightly inside-out way of doing so. Um, but uh, uh, and this this reflects back your question as to how obviously the United States and 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 uh, others are perceived in the continent. Uh, let me just say at the outset that most of Africa is with Ukraine. The perception is that most of Africa is against Ukraine, but actually most of Africa has consistently voted for Ukraine. Not only that, in fact, it's, it's 30 countries which consistently uh, vote uh, for Ukraine in the United Nations, 15 who tend to abstain, including my own South Africa, um, one or two against, normally Eritrea, the North Korea of Africa, uh, and now Mali, uh, and then a few who never pitch uh, because they prefer not to be uh, credited one way or the other. So the vo vast majority of African governments are for Ukraine, but as much as can be discerned, the vast majority of African people are for Ukraine. And there have only been so far three opinion polls conducted across the continent asking the question as to whether you're for Russia or for Ukraine. Uh, and they've been in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Tanzania, and we've had a hand in all three of them. And the answer in South Africa was 76% of South Africans uh, supported Ukraine. Uh, in Tanzania, 77% of Tanzanians, which is remarkable given its, its socialist history, perhaps. Uh, and in Zimbabwe, 58% of Zimbabweans. So overwhelmingly, uh, the, the feeling of Africans, based on, I would imagine, questions of human rights, among others, uh, is for Ukrainians. Uh, and most who have been polled have said very explicitly that their government should sh support Ukraine in some shape or form. 80% of South Africans said as much. Yet governments tend to be lukewarm on some of these issues. And to your question, this is because I believe a number of different factors. The first of these, in the case of South Africa specifically, but relates to others too, is this notion of turning the tables on global power dynamics. So the BRICS forms part of this, uh, ideology forms part of this, uh, a legacy of ideological struggles during the Cold War forms part of this, and a very neo-mercantilist, for want of a better expression, way of looking at the world which is akin in some ways to, to, to the manner of Chinese uh, views of, of, of global uh, capital and trade flows. A, a second factor is uh, the historical allegiances that some have had in the past, uh, and this particularly pertains to Southern Africa, uh, given the re relatively recent nature of the liberation struggles in Southern Africa. I think fourth, thirdly, sorry, there's hedging, uh, people just simply staying on the fence and looking as to how this is going to turn out. Um, fourthly, questions of funding, particularly Russian oligarch, oligarchs funding political parties across the continent. Um, and that's certainly the case in South Africa. The largest funder to the ruling party uh, is Viktor Vexelberg, who is uh, 
uh, on the on the uh, UN on the on the US sanctions list among others. Um, the fifth factor is questions of security, and this particularly pertains to to Mali, to the Central African Republic, uh, now increasingly to Sudan, and that's turned out very well for them. Um, uh, uh, and of course Mali as well. Um, Ethiopia would also fall into that bracket and as I've already mentioned Eritrea. And then finally there's questions, there's a question of fear. There's a, there's a personal fear, Russia has a reputation uh, in Africa. There's a fear of upsetting China which in fact is more profound particularly given the debt uh, the debt status of many African countries and Ambassador Cohen uh, in the previous session referred to uh, the, the challenges faced by the global south as a consequence of this war, plus the pandemic, plus uh, overexposure on debt uh, uh, in the pre-pandemic period. Uh, and this is the concerns about China feed into this because China is increasingly a, a holder of, of, of long-term African debt. Um, there's a question of fear in an inverted sense is that people don't really fear the West. The West has proven to be a paper tiger when it comes to uh, issues of aid calibration, of conditionality. So it's almost more fear for China, more fear as to what the Russians could do personally or indeed at the UN, uh, but, but less fear towards uh, the West uh, and, and, and a belief that the West will fund regardless. So we can, we can uh, uh, um, play them uh, in this regard. Um, and, and again, I think the question of, of the fear of cutting off options, the fear of, of not hedging is part of this. So, so when it comes to Africa, uh, um, uh, increasingly a player in global politics by reasons of demography, what we don't spend much time thinking about is what peace will look like to the earlier question which I think is perhaps the most profound question of all. We don't think about the day after. We don't think about how this is going to increase or limit our options. We don't think very importantly about what role we could be playing in that peace process. We don't think about uh, how Africa should be maneuvering currently uh, around questions uh, such as debt, around issues uh, in terms of food access or uh, supplanting the gap created uh, by, uh, by the war in terms of cereal imports into the continent. So our debate tends to be very limited. It tends to be very much focused on a combination of what's in it for us and a question, informed by a question of victimhood more than anything else and much less about proactivity in the global order. So you say the West and Europe is a given and trustworthy ally and not risky. So it's, a, it's not of a much of a threat and you, you calculate more the risks of emanating from China or Russia. So, Tommy, uh, I would like you to comment on uh, the situation uh, created in Europe. How, how, does the how has the conflict in Ukraine affected European unity? We see lately we said that we have some remarks and with some different approach uh, from France and from uh, the, the, the European front doesn't seem so uh, unified as it was in the beginning. Is that so or not? Thank, <clears throat> thank you, George, and thank you, uh, the Economic Forum. As, as many uh, speakers have already mentioned, this topic of geo, uh, geopolitical impact of war uh, in Ukraine has been repeated in many panels also, you know, I'm a fifth speaker, so as they say, everything has been said, but not by everybody. And so um, I, I, I try to put some, uh, put some uh, points. First of all, I guess, as repeated so many times, I guess the European unity has been a big surprise. Uh, to be honest, for Europeans themselves, the solidity the, uh, after the devastated uh, attack. And that, until now, has, has remained uh, quite uh, solidly. Maybe, uh, but what, what is different is, is when you start to look at the polling. So there is, if you look at the polling in different countries on uh, support uh, for Ukraine, there's a... Uh, uh, 
there's the differences. First of all, what, what we see is, of course, the eastern flank of the European Union, and I have a feeling that uh, not uh, the impact of war in Ukraine in a political atmosphere in, uh, in certain countries has not maybe fully understood by the other countries. I would claim that in North, uh, Sweden, Finland, Baltic states, some states of Central Eastern uh, Europe, um, the, the, the psycholo psychological setting is very different. In those countries, uh, people are really reflecting how to act in a, in a moment of war. We all followed the very uh, dramatic uh, decision of Finland in a couple of months to go for NATO. That comes from many factors, but one of them is being that uh, people are really thinking, adult men like me, if the war comes, where do I send it to my children? Shall we send it to Sweden? Uh, how does it feel to kill a person? And oh, you know all that, those kind of uh, discussion, and that has a fierce in, attack, uh, impact on the, I would claim politics in 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 Europe. That was particularly visible uh, well when, when um, President Macron of France made his comments a taking into account the sensitivities of, uh, or taking into account the Russian sensitivities, not humiliating Russia, and now uh, also in relation to China's comments on China, which of course have implication on the domestic de 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 debate in, in Europe. And, uh, and uh, so that's the eastern flank. Then you have a southern flank, including uh, including Greece, where if you look at the polling, you have more nuances. For cultural and historic reasons, you have more understanding even for Russia, for the Russian narrative. Also, what has many times forgotten, also in Europe, that the fact that Russia seems to to be not doing so well in, in front doesn't mean that in the disinformation campaign they are uh, not effective because they are in Europe it, uh, and it has an impact. And then you have uh, the West Europe, like where you find most support among the population is actually Spain and Portugal, maybe because there the, the economic impact of the war is, is not so strong and it's more like a moral question. So to conclude then why, but why the question why in a leadership level the unity has been maintained, maybe I would give three reasons and I would uh, conclude. First of all, of course, the moral case. The Russia has been helping the uni uh, unity because of the atrocities. It has been so overwhelming that you, as a leader of a, a premier minister of some EU member state, you cannot go to council and make a, you know, a proposal. It has been, um, the moral case has been so uh, strong. Secondly, United States. I would claim that for many countries, the reaction of the United States was quite uh, important. I would say, if you look a little bit at the dynamics in Italy, for example, um, uh, um, you know, the car current uh, uh, Prime Minister party, I think there was a lot of sensitivity, how this, uh, you know, during the formation of the government, how the whole, uh, the new government would be seen in uh, around Europe, but also in the United States. So that was one. But thirdly, and I think that's not enough discussed here in Delphi Forum, yes, but really, as, as previous speaker mentioned, the end game. So what, how will this play out if we come about to, to some uh, not so optimal peace solution? That would mean that Im immediately when the ceasefire or some kind of peace would be maintained, if it doesn't include the, 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 the loss of Russia, Russia will immediately start to build up its military, which is normal because it's uh, distracted. That would lead the reaction in Nordic countries in the eastern flank of, uh, of uh, uh, Europe. And now we are discussing about 2% of the GDP, but the reality we would be 3, 4, and, and 5. That would be the, the reality. And the big danger, and that r relates to the global perception, that would be my guess to which Greg was uh, referring, is, is that the big danger scenario is there that the eastern flank of Europe become a new Middle East, where every two, three years, new action will be, a violent action will be played out, and that would be then the dy uh, defining dynamic in Europe for upcoming one or two decades. So, Greg posed an interesting question, how will peace look like, uh, William? And uh, could you comment on uh, 
we, we are looking at the day after and we were looking at how the conflict could be resolved. So what do you see are the interests of uh, the big players, Europe, uh, USA and China? Do they have different interests uh, when it comes to resolving the conflict? And how can, how can these differences be reconciled? Well, I think in terms of the geopolitical dynamics, it's clear that this uh, war and aggression in Ukraine by Russia has reaffirmed uh, the view that uh, there is a, a multipolar um, um, set of blocks uh, emerging. Now, the strength of uh, the unity shown by the U.S. and Europe is, uh, is great to see in terms of... Uh, reaffirming the Atlantic Alliance. But I think there's uh, uh, looming trouble in terms of this partnership between Russia and China, uh, because it's clear that Russia has become even more dependent on China. So if you look at the Eurasian continent and Russia stretching across 11 time zones plus China, that leaves Europe exposed as this tiny peninsula on the edge of this, uh, this vast uh, uh, Eurasian uh, continent. And I think that's going to become more and more a, a source of uh, concern about Europe's vulnerability in, um, in the future. Um, secondly, I think the, uh, we haven't raised yet the um, Taiwan issue, but there are certain, obviously, vast differences in terms of, uh, of the, the the nature of that, of the con potential conflict. Uh, but I think that in Washington these days, it seems that uh, uh, the atmosphere is becoming more and more hawkish uh, in terms of standing up to uh, China. Um, the talk of decoupling has been pulled back a little bit by the speeches from Jake Sullivan and Janet Yellen saying, no, no, we mean de-risking, which is more like, uh, more like Europe. Uh, but I still fear that as we enter a political campaign for the election next year, that this is, this is going to heat up more and more. You hear already uh, once moderate voices talking about the need to recognize uh, Taiwanese statehood. Uh, so I think this, uh, what I'm worried about is that the conflict um, with China could spin out of control, partly because we're, we're so focused on, 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 on Ukraine and if we have two conflicts going on at the same time, uh, this is going to be uh, very perilous for uh, world stability. So the question is, uh, can, there be, can there be a solution in a day after without China? I'm sorry, without? Can there be a day after a solution without China? Well, I think it's, uh, I don't think China's uh, uh, mediation is going to be uh, successful. I think a lot will depend on uh, what transpires with the counteroffensive by Ukraine over the next few months. And I think we'll have a better read on that uh, later this year. But I just want to make one more point, which Greg mentioned about uh, Africa. And um, I think this, is also, this conflict has also shown how the West has neglected um, uh, the interests of uh, countries in, uh, well, what's called loosely the global south. But you know, obviously, Latin America, Africa, Asia, uh, the greater Middle East are, uh, have vastly different um, interests. But uh, I think this is, I think it's going to uh, focus attention more and more on uh, what we need to do. I think the last uh, successful and positive initiative by the United States in Africa was uh, George W. Bush's PEPFAR, um, AIDS uh, vaccine, which was uh, highly successful. We need more efforts like that. Uh, you know, Larry Sunder Summers was telling me at a recent conference, he talked with an African diplomat who said, uh, the reason we're not supporting you is, you know, China, when they come to us, they build an airport. When you come to us, you give us a lecture. And uh, I think that needs to change. We need to produce more tangible benefits, not just we Americans, but also in tandem with our European allies. So thank you very much. Svetlana. Do you have uh, high hopes uh, from the Chinese mediation? How do you see the possible day after? Actually, we uh, 
China is very important actor on the international arena, and uh, in Ukraine we were very happy that finally it call between leaders of both country happens, and we really hope that China will come on the side of democratic side, and we are working on it. How how do you see the the question we discuss? How does peace will look like? Do you have any uh, comments on this? Yes, for sure. We have a clear understanding how peace uh, can look like, and our President Zelensky declared it several months ago in his peace formula. And for us, how peace look like? It means that we will get back all our territories according to UN chapter. It means according to the border of 1991. It means for us that all the Russian troops will withdraw Ukraine territories, and we, as Ukraine will get guarantees that it will never happen again. We also hope that justice will work and international tribunal will be established to make Russia accountable for all Russian war crimes caused in Ukraine. Actually, for one year, um, together with my colleagues and together with Office of President, we are running project called Russian war crime exhibition and we collect in cases which will be used later in tribunal and as for now we have more than 70,000 registered Russian war crimes cases in Ukraine and I'm sure it will be much more and more and another coming back to peace solution we should make clear that all non-nuclear states will have guarantees against nuclear states. I was really very surprised that this question wasn't discussed during the Delphi Economic Forum, because nuclear safety, it, it, it is what is really matters, and we want to make sure that never again nuclear plant in whatever another country in the world will be under occupation. And what is now case in Ukraine, as you know, the Parisian nuclear plant is now controlled by Russia, and is what they use in all possible negotiation from their side, because as you know, radiation has no border. Nobody knows what they will decide tomorrow. Yesterday, they decided uh, to attack Ukrainian peaceful city, Uman, but tomorrow maybe they will decide to use nuclear weapons. It's a real danger nowadays. And of course, we want to make sure uh, that there will be uh, no case uh, with using uh, this... Uh, Food security, it sh food should be secured for entire continent, for African countries, for other countries, and of course, uh, Ukraine grain export should be secured. And the next point in this peace formula is energy security. You know, it was a real case for Ukraine this winter, and it was case also for the whole Europe, because speaking about energy security, for the Europe, we are speaking about crisis, uh, high prices for energy in Europe. But speaking about Ukraine, we're speaking about people living the whole winter without electricity, without water, without internet connection. It was our case with Tatiana. We spent winter in Kyiv without this everything. Can someone from you imagine spent winter in city without electricity. It's something impossible, but it's our reality. And of course, at the end, sorry for being so emotional because it's about our country. We really need that a new architecture of global security would be established and Ukraine get guarantees. And of course, each, end, uh, each war should end with agreement and we need signed agreement by both sides. Okay, Tommy, do you wanted to make a comment? Two, one, uh, one and a half a minute, uh, just about this China dimension. I had pleasure to be some months ago in Asia, this kind of setting under Chad Hamas rules, and the interesting was that you had Russians and Ukrainians also. So one, uh, two points there about China. It's, it, it came between lines very clear that what is the Russian thinking, at least those people, is that how they play it, that when the moment of the deal making comes, we get everybody involved, Chinese, Indians, whoever, and that will be then the tool to create a new global security order, use that dynamics to kind of fix that, number one. And number two, also it, that the Russians were, uh, no, uh, Russians were painfully aware that Chinese are milking the situation. 
Russians are cornered, you know, they're giving the resources, cheap prices, and they know that. And the message was a little bit there than, listen, you know, there's Ch you know, the Chinese are playing us. As Russians, you Europeans, come on, we have to do something. You know. Interesting. Uh, I will give the last word to you because you talked about the day after and the business, so you must elaborate on this. But I wanted a final comment from uh, you, Greg, on uh, the day after, and how would uh, the the third poll would play out. Thank you. I, I have to comment uh, also on uh, uh, Bill's uh, note about uh, the U.S. giving Africans a lecture and uh, China giving them an airport. Um, I think that's a little unfair, uh, even if I have to defend your own country. Um, the Chinese don't give anything away. Let me just restate that. The Chinese don't give anything away. I'm currently the strategic advisor to the president of Zambia. And let me tell you, the Chinese don't give anything away. Trying to renegotiate debt with them is quite a task. I guess the question is, is for Africa at least, are we going to see, as a consequence of this war, an end to the great aid game? It's a big question for us, because it has been a game. Um, it's not delivered development. It has been a means, to use the title of a book I wrote recently, of creating expensive poverty. It's not really delivered the growth rates, because you've given it to countries that, by and large, were going to squander it anyway, because those are the conditions that they were in. There are exceptions like PEPFAR, um, which have made a tremendous difference. difference but they've generally gone round the state rather than strengthen the state. Um, or are we going to see a worse game emerge out of this? And what do I mean by a worse game? A game where you see the sorts of Cold War practices uh, which led to the likes of folk like Mobutu Sese Seko and others getting huge amounts of support based on their supposed allegiances to one side or the other. If I looked at the consequences of this in 20 seconds and said, what's a more positive outcome for my continent? I would say it's a more positive outcome where we are more assertive, we are, we, where we come out of this more competitive, where we have better sets of policies, where we take agency uh, in, globe, in the global community. A negative scenario is that we look weaker, um, that we are undermined, uh, as a consequence of this, that we focus on the things that we haven't got rather than create them for ourselves, and that we overwhelmingly become more authoritarian. And I do think that that's one of the reasons why many African leaders are, let's say, empathetic to the Russian position, because they like the oligarchic authoritarian model. It offers them the opportunity to make large amounts of money and never be challenged at the poll. And P.S., one last point. Um, it obviously depends on the way in which Ukraine emerges out of this conflict. If we see a Ukraine that has built very strong familial and other business commercial networks throughout uh, uh, Central and Western Europe, I think it's, it's one thing. If we see a Ukraine emerge out of this conflict which is dismembered, which is in a state of perpetual frozen conflict, then it's another altogether and the subject of a much longer discussion. Thank you, Greg. How could we, how could the Europe and the West help the day after uh, and the reconstruction of Ukraine? And what would be the opportunities? Yes. Thank you, you have very the final. Much. Yep. Uh, we are extremely grateful to the US, to the EU for everything you do on our path to victory and take into account that we are fighting on different front lines and we do understand the economy is extremely important because it also to support the lion-hearted our fighters at the front line and what we see we just back from the from United States, from Washington DC where I took part in the US-Ukraine partnership forum so we did discuss and we delivered the clear message. Ukraine is open for business. We do understand that the damages or the scale is extremely massive. And we do understand that how important it is to get private sector engaged, international partners to get engaged. We do understand that there are five sources for construction and recovery, where the money come, will come from. Of course, donors, and we appreciate all the support. Then will be the loans, then, of course, Russian assets, then Ukrainian budget. Now it's very difficult to understand, but, of course, private sector. And while we are getting ready to this event, we ask investors, what should be the priority? And, of course, it is a security and defense. Security and defense is the number one 
priority. That's why at this moment, because we have a feeling that reconstruction has already started, because we need roads, we need buildings, we need hospitals. I live in a place, you probably see a picture where the bridge was broken and people were going through that bridge. So we need this infrastructure. That's why we call companies, don't wait, don't miss the bus, come to Ukraine, come now, we are working closely now with DFC, with MIGA, making sure that there is in place war insurance, political insurance, and we'll continue to do so. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you very much for, for this discussion, for this opportunity to share the view of the business community and also to invite you to join this effort. Thank you very much. Uh, we thank you all. We had uh, exactly 50 minutes. So thank you very much, Mr. Drozdiak, Mrs. Kovalchuk, Mrs. Prokopchuk, Mr. Mills, and uh, Mr. Hutanen. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, discussion. Thank you very much, George, for your great moderation. Great pleasure.